I just want to check if you have been informed that we have to make an yes, okay, uh, version there because you're here. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, because Thank I cannot be here this afternoon, so otherwise... Yes. Thank you. Yes. No problem. I say thank you very much. Yes, I feel much better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Feel that day to go around the world? No, and I'm saying something very beautiful. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, that's what I feel like. Hello. I think, please take your seats. We should start quite soon. And... Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Julian Osborne from the University of Leicester and is uh, an X-ray astronomer and he has worked extensively with the SWIFT data. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak at this meeting. Um, I'm going to say some uh, words to introduce myself um, uh, and uh, then uh, just offer a few thoughts about uh, some of the challenges uh, in front of uh, this enterprise. Um, the title of my talk on the agenda is Challenges to Open Data Provision or something like that. Um, that's not really uh, the thrust I wanted to present, um, uh, but nevertheless one can't help noticing uh, that this isn't easy, otherwise it would al already have been done. So. Um, uh, at, at Leicester, we've been involved in um, uh, space research for uh, many decades. Uh, the group was founded in 1960, um, and uh, those of you of a certain age may recognize uh, Ken Pounds as a young man there looking somewhat disinterested in the proceedings uh, going on in this uh, early research project. Um, uh, for myself, um, I arrived uh, at uh, Leicester from uh, the European Space Agency working on the Exat project um, in 1990, um, and uh, there's a picture of the Exasat control room uh, on this slide. Uh, and my, uh, in my entire career has really been about uh, the provision of uh, uh, data uh, to enable uh, high-energy astrophysics research. Um, and uh, initially that was uh, making use of uh, uh, after the ESA phase where I worked with Paolo, Jomi and uh, other people um, uh, was uh, on the basis of uh, ROSAT um, for which the UK provided a, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a far UV uh, telescope. Um, and building on that we uh, uh, we created something called the Leicester Data Archive Service, LIDAS, um, uh, which uh, ran for about a decade um, in providing uh, data uh, from uh, multiple satellites um, online, um, uh, and so it was built out of the very early Exosat database uh, concepts. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, the Japanese uh, missions had some uh, Leicester involvement, Ginga and Asker, and then uh, the, the next major activity was uh, the XMM uh, Survey Science Centre, which was led from the University of Leicester by uh, Mike Watson, and I was involved in the, uh, uh, the architectural design of the science analysis software for XMM, also uh, uh, the provision of analysis tools and uh, pipeline uh, and bulk data processing, and also involved in the creation of uh, the source catalogs from XMEM. And then more recently, I've been involved in, in SWIFT. So um, just to uh, talk about the kinds of things that uh, get prepared, um, uh, here we, uh, is a slide about the uh, XMM Survey Science Centre and the catalogs uh, that have been produced. Uh, the Survey Science Centre was led for over a decade by the University of Leicester. It's now moved, uh, the leadership has now moved to Toulouse. Uh, over uh, over the, the many years of XMM, uh, eight catalogues have been produced with ever-increasing uh, numbers of sources, uh, 
uh, and higher levels of sophistication in the analysis of the data. Uh, the most recent uh, was published by Simon Rosen and others in 2016, and it has uh, about 400,000 unique uh, sources. This is the largest X-ray catalog ever produced and provides spectra and light curves uh, from this X-ray mission uh, uh, for about 100,000 sources. And you can see some examples of those, the variety of spectra and the, and the types of things you might see in, in the light curves down the bottom there. So on the bottom left, you can see a, a galactic uh, coordinate projection of the, uh, of the sky as seen by XMM. XMM has quite a small field of view, so it just depends where the, where the observers propose to point the thing, where is, which is where it detects uh, its sources. And then in top right, you can see some improvements that have been made by the, um, the experts working on uh, the catalog uh, to improve the signal to noise that's possible in the image analysis and thereby detect fainter sources by uh, optimization of background uh, level selection. So for SWIFT, which is what I've been involved in more in the last decade, um, uh, I just want to give a bit more detail because um, this somehow provides a, a, a context for um, what I'm going to say later on. So essentially, um, uh, the work that's uh, done in the UK are for SWIFT, which is of course a, a US, uh, UK, Italian project, um, that work is funded by the UK Space Agency, which is um, uh, a, a growing uh, uh, agency. It's quite small at the moment. Um, uh, and that work uh, takes place at uh, two places in the UK, uh, where, and the majority of that work, in fact, occurs at Leicester. Um, so scientific investigations by scientists wanting to do particular projects on SWIFT, for example, uh, would be funded by... Uh, uh, a different organization, so the space agency uh, provides funding for missions uh, and that includes uh, the post mission the post well the post launch phase so this is the post launch support i 'm talking about in fact, at Leicester, we provided the um, camera for the x ray telescope on Swift, and so we have uh, uh, roles in the uh, calibration of that uh, camera. Uh, and we also provide a Swift Science Data Center. And uh, the clients of that Swift Science Data Center are scientists around the world uh, making use of um, the data uh, and the software, uh, some of which is provided by Lester and some of which is provided by Matteo Perry, who I see has just walked into the room, uh, at uh, ASDC. So, um, of course, uh, um, and I'll come back to this, uh, you know, our activities are funded uh, because of the scientific productivity of SWIFT, uh, because it's very highly regarded um, uh, in the senior partner, the uh, 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 NASA, where there are regular reviews of the uh, value for money of ongoing missions, um, and uh, because of the opinion of an oversight committee, uh, which advises uh, the space agency on the value of the work that we do. Nevertheless, um, although we've had continuing support, that has declined through the uh, life of the mission. It was launched in 2004 when we had seven full-time staff per year. Now we're down to three after 13 years. Uh, so um, uh, efficiencies uh, have to be made. It's worth noting in this context that SWIFT data is public uh, as soon as it hits the ground. Um, and uh, that it can hit the ground within seconds of the data being taken on board uh, because of the um, use of the TDRIS uh, system for prompt data download. So just some examples of the kinds of things that um, uh, a, a data centre uh, might be responsible for. These are some images relating to the calibration of the X-ray camera on SWIFT. Um, we have to plan observations of uh, uh, supernova remnants. For example, here's uh, multiple exposure uh, taken of the Tycho supernova remnant. And we use those. These spectra are rich in lines. You can see that in the bottom uh, center plot. Um, we use those emission lines to monitor the performance of the uh, X-ray detector. 
um, which is being continuously damaged by the radiation environment in space. And so you can see uh, in that bottom center plot, for example, uh, the red curve shows you um, uh, a, a corrected uh, version of the spectrum of this supernova remnant, in fact a different supernova remnant, um, uh, uh, and in black it shows you the uh, data as collected on board, uh, which has had its spectral resolution degraded uh, by uh, uh, high energy particle impacts in the silicon detector, which is used to make the measurements. And those uh, particle impacts cause uh, uh, charge trapping in the detector um, and thereby reducing the apparent energy of the X-ray photons and uh, correction of charge traps is illustrated in that bottom left plot, for example. The detector also has um, a number of uh, radioactive sources on board and we can continuously monitor the uh, gain um, of the instrument uh, that way and uh, the images at the top right show the evolution through the life of the mission of uh, the energies of those lines. I'll just show you. So this shows you the, uh, the continuous radiation damage effects on the X-ray detector and from that information we derive the overall gain but also the parallel and serial charge transfer inefficiencies and, um, and the numbers that have to go into the calibration files which enable this data to be correctly used. That data also enables us to correct for temperature dependencies, uh, as illustrated in the, um, uh, the bottom pair of plots, where you can see before and after temperature correction uh, resulting from this calibration work. So this kind of work is an essential component of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a data center for an operating mission where uh, we have to make sure that people don't make scientific mistakes because they're misinterpreting um, the information that they're getting from the instrument. And of course the calibration always lags uh, the observations because it takes some time to do the work. So uh, the other activity at uh, Leicester for SWIFT is the uh, UK SWIFT Science Data Centre um, and uh, this has a number of uh, jobs which I've listed on this slide. Um, uh, I've underlined uh, at the top there that it does this work promptly. So SWIFT data, um, bulk SWIFT data comes to the ground um, multiple times a day. SWIFT is in low Earth orbit uh, and uh, that data gets processed uh, at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center um, uh, to a certain level and then is transmitted to uh, the Italian and the UK uh, data centers uh, where we're able to uh, take that uh, processing uh, up to higher levels. So, and this all occurs completely automatically uh, over the internet uh, and it occurs as soon as the data uh, becomes available, which after the Goddard uh, processing phase is typically uh, an hour or so. And so um, uh, the data center uh, at Leicester produces science data products for the gamma ray bursts. These things fade extraordinarily quickly and so their scientific value uh, is all about uh, what you can learn immediately so that you know which ones are interesting uh, for follow-up, for example, with the VLT or other large facilities. Um, SWIFT, because it is designed to be a very flexible satellite uh, in terms of its pointing and sky availability, is very good for all sorts of time domain studies. Um, and so uh, we also provide... Um, uh, user-controlled science data products service so the user is able to specify what they want uh, from what data they want to go into the processing what uh, products they want to come out um, and uh, we will do the processing for them this is all done uh, without human contact essentially through the web um, and the, depending on the amount of data processing uh, the results are provided basically on a time scale of, a, of minutes to uh, perhaps uh, tens of minutes if it's a very large data set. Uh, we also um, uh, are able automatically to perform uh, a mosaic analysis for very large uh, error regions such as provided by gravitational wave and neutrino uh, facilities. Uh, again, all of this is, has to be done automatically. Uh, we have so few staff uh, that it just isn't feasible to do any of this uh, 
by hand. Of course, you have to build the system uh, by hand initially, but then uh, automation is the, is the only way to live. Uh, we provided an X-ray point source catalogue, which is currently a static catalogue. In future, that will become a, 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 a kind of currently updated system. Um, we also provide advice and training, uh, publication lists, uh, PR listings, and outreach. And there's a nice picture of one of our staff being interviewed uh, for the Sky at Night TV program down there. So um, I, I won't go through all this. It just shows that... Uh, We've, uh, we've got a worldwide uh, clientele for all of this. Of course, everything is provided at no cost. Um, uh, and uh, the usage levels are, are gratifying, and we use this information to our space agency as part of the justification for the continuation of our work. Um, so here are some examples of the specific kinds of things uh, that uh, have to be done, for example, with gamma-ray bursts, where... Um, they evolve very quickly, uh, so you can see at top left a light curve in uh, X-rays of uh, the afterglow of a gamma-ray burst. It consists of uh, a number of uh, power law decline um, uh, behaviours uh, with some flares superimposed. All of this has to be automatically analysed as soon as the data uh, gets to us, um, and so. It's this information which informs us about the uh, levels of interest in this gamma ray burst uh, and the feasibility of continued observation with SWIFT. Um, we also perform uh, intelligent uh, position analysis to get the very best from the rather modest telescope that uh, SWIFT has on board. Um, uh, we perform uh, multi-instrument analysis to produce uh, spectrum-corrected uh, flux light curves which, so it's, it's all very well presenting uh, count rate uh, light curves, but of course theoreticians don't work in count rate, they work in flux, so we have to correct for instrumental aspects, and so, um, and combining instruments working in different wave bands is somewhat challenging for that, so uh, we've done a number of uh, uh, things to produce uh, light curves at any particular monochromatic uh, uh, energy that you choose. Um, and also, um, because the early data is so important with SWIFT, um, we uh, uh, perform uh, position analysis on the very first seconds of data that come down. Um, going further, <coughs> we're now incorporating the UV optical telescope data into our light curve analyses, um, and we've also been working to improve the photometric uh, capabilities of the X-ray instrument. Uh, the X-ray instrument has some dead pixels in it, um, and if you don't know precisely where the telescope is pointing, then you don't know what fraction of uh, the counts are falling on the dead pixels, uh, and so we've incorporated an automatic um, uh, position centroiding system to improve the photometric accuracy, uh, which you can see illustrated on the right there. Um, we've produced uh, an X-ray catalog. It's not the only X-ray catalog from SWIFT, but it's, uh, I believe, the latest one. Uh, it has 70,000 new X-ray sources in it. It's got a much larger sky coverage than XMM because it has a... Uh, because XM, uh, SWIFT looks at a lot more different parts of the sky. Um, this catalog has um, a lot of supporting information in it, uh, as well as uh, data products from spectra and light curves. It also has a very full analysis of the false positive rate uh, for uh, different um, quality levels of uh, the uh, sources in the catalogue and also a, a complete completeness analysis. So these are important uh, things which some, sometimes get neglected. Okay, so um, finally then, just specifically about SWIFT, um, following up gravitational wave alerts is of uh, enormous interest at the moment. Um, you can see uh, the top left there, the black line uh, is uh, an advanced LIGO error region, um, and you can see in blue and yellow uh, the avoidance regions that SWIFT can't look at for the moon and the sun, and then in pink you can see uh, the uh, footprint of the burst alert telescope, the uh, instrument on SWIFT which has a very large field of view. Unfortunately it missed most of the LIGO error region. Um, and then at the bottom below that you can see 
um, a convolution of that LIGO error region with a, 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 a galaxy catalog um, where we think uh, gamma ray bursts may emerge, so we only try to look at the galaxies. And then on the right you can see an exposure map from uh, one of the mosaics uh, which Swift uh, X-ray telescope used to uh, try to cover some of this advanced LIGO error region. That's a relatively small one. We're, we're making much larger, uh, uh, very shallow 50-second observations trying to cover as much of this gra gravitational wave error region as quickly as possible to detect the associated X-ray source. Okay, so the uh, challenges. So, I, I mean, I've spoken to... Uh, Andy uh, Pollock and uh, Paolo Jomi about um, this meeting only very briefly. Um, uh, I've been involved in the business of providing data uh, uh, for uh, some years now um, and I suppose the first thing to say is that the primary challenge to ongoing provision is one of desire. Do, do, does the community that is going to be paying for this want this? Because if they don't want it, they're not going to pay for it. Uh, and eventually it comes down uh, to the perceived <coughs> balance of value. Um, and at the space agency level, I suppose they would be faced with the question, is it better to spend the money keeping Archive X going uh, or uh, build some new uh, observing facility? This is the key decision that the scientists involved in this process are going to be asking themselves. And it has to be said that the pull of novelty is very powerful. Science progresses by the application of new technologies. So if you're going to say uh, we want to keep um, the data from this 30-year-old uh, uh, satellite available, therefore you can't have a new telescope, um, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a controversial thing to be saying. So uh, that means that you have to get your arguments uh, well honed uh, to defend yourself against that sort of, uh, 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 of challenge. So archive provision uh, can only really survive if it's somehow protected. Uh, of course, it has to be useful. It has to be appropriately staffed because just putting stuff on the web uh, is the route to death. Um, and it has to be relatively inexpensive because it's going to last a long time. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that uh, there are some tensions in that list. If it's protected, then it's not subjected to uh, scientific scrutiny so how do you know it's useful? You've got to get that balance right somehow. If it's appropriately staffed, it probably isn't going to be inexpensive. Uh, that's, a, that's a major challenge because um, the, development of, the development phase of a mission um, pre-launch might be uh, five, might be ten, might be more years, depending on the scale of the mission. Um, but the archive phase can be extremely long indeed. So... Uh, you know, just integrating up that uh, annual spend can result in uh, significant expenditure. Um, I have to say that uh, just from the UK perspective, our performance in this area has been pretty mixed. Um, we've uh, supported optical surveys uh, uh, over the years, um, and uh, it has to be said that the Leicester Data Archive Service was supported through two or three uh, funding cycles of three years, uh, but the UK has definitely pulled out of things that it doesn't feel are scientifically value for money. And uh, so I list uh, La Palma Observatory, Gemini, uh, James Clark Maxwell Telescope. It pulled out of XMM, which was particularly painful for me and my colleagues after 10 years. And of course, we just pulled out of the EU. So we're famous for it, I'm afraid. Um, it's also worth noting some differences between how things may occur uh, in continental Europe and in the UK. Uh, there's generally no standing army of staff in UK science. So if I want to do some, uh, some scientific work, even archive provision, I have to go in front of a committee and uh, defend that idea in front of them in competition with every other idea which comes along. Um, uh, and... Uh, you know, when a mission is producing new data and it's exciting and it's at the forefront, uh, then of course defending that idea isn't too difficult, but uh, 10 years down the line uh, it can be pretty tough. Uh, now, the very largest projects in the UK, such as the ex uh, experiments 
Atlas and CMS at the Large Hadron Collider, they have long uh, time horizons. Um, I'm on a, a funding committee that uh, examines uh, all of STFC's uh, projects and I see how these things work. There's some inertia for these very large, highly international projects. The UK doesn't always want to be seen to be the bad boy uh, pulling out of things. Uh, I'm, this is my last slide. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, for smaller levels of investment, um, the timescales for continued uh, uh, activity are shorter. And indeed, observatories come and go on a decade-like timescale. Uh, so not to in end on an entirely negative note, um, I do want to note uh, that uh, just in the last month, uh, a new investment has been announced at Leicester a National Space Park. Uh, this will have uh, eventually um, um, a value of around £75 million. The first phase funding uh, of some tens of millions is already in place from the central government, from the university and from industry. Uh, this space park uh, will focus on uh, satellite hardware, uh, and the provision of low-cost access to space. Importantly for this meeting, space-enabled data uh, and skills for UK industry. This will have uh, a location in the north of Leicester. It'll be next to the National Space Centre, which is a, uh, a, uh, an exhibition centre uh, in Leicester uh, all about space. It's very popular. It was uh, uh, built at the time of the millennium, um, and there's plenty of interesting space hardware to go and look at also a 200-seat planetarium uh, and a, um, a film production company which makes films for that planetaria and planetaria around the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, question down there. Jomi? Okay, I'll try to shout. You've been saying very, very nice things about uh, Swift, which is doing very, very beautiful uh, uh, results. Uh, you didn't mention that it's, uh, everything in, in SWIFT is actually open. And the SWIFT is actually an mission that has started out as a PI mission with open data. And uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the fact that everything is open immediately to everyone, it didn't stop the PI uh, and, and the groups are doing a very good for science. In fact, they multiply the science. So uh, the, 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 the need to have a, a, a restricted period, uh, at least is a, a, we need to think about that. SWIFT is just an example of, uh, of uh, something that can be run in a completely open uh, environment uh, to the benefit of everyone without damaging the, the rights of the people who invested a lot of their time to, to, to build the satellites. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Paolo. That's a, that's a good point. Um, so um, it's very challenging to work on a project where the data is publicly available as soon as it touches the ground. Um, uh, and um, uh, it was a change of culture for um, me personally and, and the, the SWIFT team. Uh, uh, and uh, it has to be recognized that um, some results do, did make it into the literature which were incorrect because of that. That's part of openness. It's a cost of openness. Um, and uh, I think uh, in consideration uh, of the principle of this meeting, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, the cultures in different areas of science are very different um, and their tolerance of uh, the ability of people to put into the public domain incorrect results is very low. Uh, we can think of uh, advanced LIGO, for example, as a contemporary case, but also in particle physics. Uh, it's uh, uh, very uncommon uh, to allow um, people to draw their own conclusions and put them in the public domain um, without them going through uh, the scientists, uh, the scientists involved in the experiments. Mm 